Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the eDiscovery mini series. I'm Terry Modisett, the Executive Director of the Centre for Legal Innovation at the College of Law, and we are absolutely delighted to be partnering on this mini series with the always wonderful Kate Clark and her exceptional team that you will also hear from today. And of course, Enhanced Litigation Management Solutions. This is episode four. So I hope you enjoy this one and you've been enjoying the ones before and you'll be enjoying the one after. This one is of course, as you can see on selecting the right tool for the right matter. So with that having been said, Kate, I'm going to hand over to you and I'll be hovering in the background, but I'll definitely come back towards the end to say goodbye. Welcome, everyone. You're going to really enjoy this session. Thank you so much, Terry, for that lovely introduction as usual. So as Terry said, today we're going to be talking about how you go about selecting the right tool for your matter. Um, we're also going to be talking about what products are available to support the litigation process and other, other processes within that today, when you should use the products, what training is involved, um, and whether you can bring those tools in-house or use an external provider. We're going to run you through the cost of it. Um, we're going to tell you how the tools are going to evolve or how we expect they will evolve over the future. And then we're going to run through some of our top benefits of each tool. So let's get stuck in. So um, firstly, um, how do you go about selecting the right provider or the right tool for your matter? So this is a question that we often get asked as e-discovery providers. And, and just so everybody knows that e-discovery providers often usually support and are experts in at least one, if not two particular products that they use internally. So when you're going out and looking for um, someone to support your litigation process, you really buying an expert in that particular tool. So let's talk about what you need to look for when you go, go about um, buying yourself an e-discovery expert. So of course, as, a, as an absolute must, they must be an expert in the products that they are providing to you. So they must know it. when you ask a question, you should expect that they will know the answer and then provide some extra value to you on that particular product. Um, we like to make sure that we understand the litigation process. So at Elms, we educate all of our staff on the litigation process if they don't already know it when they come to us so that they can make sure that when you head into the next stage of your litigation process, they know what functionality you might need to use in your litigation database to help you get through that particular process. We like all of our staff to understand the pricing models that they're working in and the processes of each database so that they can help you to identify ways to reduce the cost of the database if that's at all possible. So a really good example of this is when we do a junk culling process at Elm. So when we identify your documents, we collect them, then we import them into the database and we go through this process to identify anything that we know is completely irrelevant in your data. So it might be the emails you're getting from Dan Murphy's for your delivery on a, on a cold Saturday night, or it might be um, emails from the netball teams or the, the soccer teams or the footy team. So we take all of that junk out of the database and that does a couple of things. It certainly reduces the cost of storing those documents in the database, but more importantly, it means the legal team don't have to review them, which is the bit that's really gonna cost you a lot of money. So if your e-discovery provider understands the pricing model and the processes within the database, they'll be able to reduce costs in, that, in those types of ways for you throughout your matter. Uh, the next one is absolutely essential. Your e-discovery provider must be able to talk to IT people and legal people and interpret those different um, types of people's language so that you're all on the same page. That's an absolute must. So you would expect that your e-discovery provider can go talk to the IT team at your client's company and then talk to you and you will all understand exactly what is, what is happening throughout that process. And of course, they must be really responsive to your queries and give great client service. So if you're not getting great client service from your e-discovery provider, my advice to you would be to switch providers and do it very quickly. Um, it's an absolute must. Uh, lawyers' jobs are hard enough without not getting really good client service with someone who's trying to help you. And then the next thing, of course, you need to think about is which litigation software to use. So, of course, um, it, you, the software that you're choosing must be fit for purpose. There's no point using a piece of software that's a litig that is a um, document management um, piece of software in a law firm for a, to support a litigation process. It's just not fit for that particular purpose. So you must make sure that it has really good e-discovery functionality, just good basic e-discovery functionality, because that's what you'll use for 95% of the time. 
it must have bank grade security. So we are finding more and more these days that every law firm or corporate client that we deal with requires us to make sure that our data is stored in Australia and all of our documents are stored in Australia. So it's certainly something you should be asking of your provider. Another thing to look for is, is, is the database that your, providers, that your provider has selected to use, is it easy to administer in the back end? So um, what really adds value to your matters is when uh, people like Sam and Kira get into the, the database at the back end and they run uh, particular jobs for you so that it makes your life easier. So you want to make sure that process is really easy and quick for the um, consultants to do. So some of the products are really easy to use in the back end and some take a bit more time. So if you've selected a product that takes a bit more time, then it's going to cost you more money from the consulting end. Um, of course, the product must comply with the current rules set out by the relevant courts in Australia. And if they don't comply with that, then you would be looking for some sort of workaround uh, or workflow that they've implemented that will get you across that process. Um, in our view, it must have, your product must have technology assisted review or AI technology. So we use a process called continuous active learning, which Kira is going to talk to you about later. We use that on every matter and that assists you to streamline your legal review process and push all of the relevant documents to the, to the top of your review set. So certainly that, that's a really handy bit of tech that you should have available to you for every matter that you do, that you conduct a legal review on. And the next thing we would say about your product is don't pay for all the bells and whistles if you don't need them. So if you've got a really a smaller matter with not a lot of complexity in it, then you just need a basic e-discovery product. So don't go and buy the top end database product because you're, you, you're, you're literally just tipping money down the sink. So just find a product that can do the basic functionality and by all means, give us a ring if you need to know the answer to that. Um, and, and then use that product and you'll, you'll get good value for your money there. And the final thing is to avoid user license fees if that's at all possible. So there are a couple of the products that charge a user license fee along with a data storage um, a fee uh, throughout your litigation process. So if you can uh, get rid of those user license fees and that is a really good idea because they can really accumulate over the months and months that you are using the product. So now we're going to talk about uh, the next process, which is uh, the management of documents in litigation and how a litigation database can help you. Um, so firstly, Sam, could you run us through what legal processes litigation databases support, please? Yeah, sure. So litigation databases are designed to support the whole litigation process, but more specifically, they target legal review and disclosure. So the software is going to allow you to organize your data easily and effectively, and it's going to mean you're going to be able to tag documents to pleadings, witness statements or summaries, expert reports, chronologies, briefs to counsel, submissions, e-trials, etc. And anything else you might need to keep organized in your matter, it's going to be able to manage that as well. So effectively, because you can organize documents in multiple ways, these databases support the whole litigation process, starting from identification of documents right through to e-trial. And they're also very effective for supporting investigations or to comply with regulatory requirements. You use the same functionality of that database, but just adjust the workflow to the needs of your matter. So as a piece of software, the basic functionality is deduplication, making all the documents searchable, organizing a document set, and then advanced searching. So it makes the product really applicable for anyone who needs to store documents without the ability to alter the content of them and then search across those documents. So as a piece of software, a litigation database has a whole lot of different use cases. Yes. Yeah, so Sam, what are the other use cases that you're talking about? So we have lots of corporate clients who use this software in-house for internal investigations before they engage with an external law firm. So to give you an example, the corporate client received an email indicating that a potential claim was coming and they were able to upload the relevant documents and build a chronology around those events so that they could assess the likelihood of a claim prior to instructing that external law firm. So in that particular case, because they had all the relevant documents in their chronology, they were able to defend it aggressively and the claim was not pursued. And we also have another corporate client who uses it for internal staff investigations. So if there's a claim for bullying or harassment, they again can import the, in, the emails between those individuals and look at those emails in conversation thread to see if any action is warranted. 
So I guess the point I'm trying to get across is that any scenario that you need to look through lots of emails or documents, these tools are specifically designed to do that very efficiently. Fantastic. Thank you, Sam. So now we're going to talk about what products are available in Australia today. So um, at the moment, we have a product called Newix Discover. We have Real Reveal Brain Space, Relativity One, Relativity and EDT. So Newix Discover or Ringtail, as you might have heard of it before, has been around for the longest in Australia. It started back in about the 1990s after the billion dollar collapse of the estate mortgage trust case. Um, there were 12 parties in that case and around 750,000 documents. So the tools, thankfully, have really evolved over those last 20 years from just supporting disclosure to now supporting the whole process from identification of document sources through to e-trial. So Kate, how do lawyers go about working out which one they like or that they should choose? Yeah, look, that's that's an excellent question. So for me, it comes down to personal choice, really. Um, so the products, whilst they have the same basic functionality, the interfaces and how you interact with that interface uh, is really different. So for instance, we choose Newix Discover as our preferred product because of a couple of things. So firstly, bank grade security, which is an absolute must. It has really, really good um, basic e-discovery functionality. The interface is really intuitive. So Newix have spent a really a lot of time working out how lawyers like to navigate around software and they've built that into the product. So it's really easy to use. Um, in addition to that, it's really easy for our team to administer in the back end, which will reduce your consulting costs throughout your process. Um, it of course has AI and analytical functionality, which we think is a must for every database. Um, and, and we of course have been experts in this tool for many, many years, having used it since the 1990s. Um, Newix Discover is also a really price competitive um, product and it doesn't charge any user fees. So, so for me, I suppose this tool brings really good value to our clients. But when it comes down to it, um, it's really just the lawyer's, the lawyer's choice when you look at it. So you might have to try a few different ones to find the one that is perfect for you. Um, but I, I think it's really worth doing. So if you, you know, if you're a, a, someone who really loves relativity, then you want to stay with that product all the time because you'll get the best benefit out of it. Again, if you're someone who likes Newix Discover, then you want to stay with that all the time because you'll really be able to use it to your advantage. So there might be some specific matters that require specific tools. For example, if you were going to conduct like a fraud investigation, then you might want extra AI functionality or something like sentiment analysis, which, which exists in Reveal Brain Space. But I suppose for a lawyer to determine it would be really difficult because you'd have to understand all of the different functionality of every product and then decide. And whilst most e-discovery providers have used most products, it's really hard to get around the different functionality throughout each product. So I think the more appropriate thing, thing to do is just to select the e-discovery expert that meets your needs and then trust their judgment on the product they choose. So if the provider has more than one product, they might sway you in one direction over the other and they'll be able to explain why that is the case. Um, so Kira, now can we talk about when should you use a litigation database? Yeah, sure. So really, there's a solution for all size matters, small to large and anything in between. So for small matters, which would be around 100 and 1,500 documents, you don't need the power of a full litigation database. So we would recommend a hyperlink spreadsheet or a fully text searchable PDF solution. But we may use the power, processing power of a litigation database to deduplicate the document set for you and then produce a spreadsheet from the database to hyperlink it. So you don't actually have to access the database, but you still get the benefit of its functionality at a cheaper or fixed fee price. So for documents over 1500 documents, particularly if that set contains emails and their attachments, we would recommend a litigation database. Another really useful way to use a database is for a quick email review. So if your client dumps their email inbox on you and you need to review it, or perhaps run some keyword searches across it to find the relevant documents, then the most efficient way to get this task done would be to use a litigation database. So the benefits you get there are to remove any duplicates so that you only have to look at one email once. You can search across the entire document set and you can also review the emails in conversation threads so you can see the whole conversation at once. So Kira, what is the smallest and largest data set you've dealt with? So the smallest data set was around 392 documents and the largest has probably been around 4.5 million documents. 
But Kate, I think you've done a 9.5 million data set at some stage, is that right? Yeah, I sure have, Kira. You know, if you think about that volume of documents, there's absolutely no way you can get through that many documents without the power of a litigation database. Um, so if you consider your own inbox, it's pretty easy to get to thousands of documents really quickly when you think about emails and their attachments. So these days we don't often see matters that are under around 5,000 documents. So you might only think you've got 1,000 emails, but when you add in the attachments, um, that number can really quickly and easily blow out. So I suppose now guys, we need to tell everybody how hard it is to train someone in these tools and how long does that process take? So the software is quite complex and advanced, which means it might not be as intuitive as turning on an iPhone and working it out for yourself. So we would highly recommend engaging experts in the field who can train you on how to use the software. So at Elms, we offer a couple of different training sessions. So initially we have a one hour to 1.5 hour navigation training session, which basically gives you the basics of how to navigate the software, interact with the documents and get everything organized. And then from there, you would have a searching or advanced searching training, maybe even, even some email threading training or analytics. Or if we've designed a specific workflow for you and your team, you would also need training for that as well. But in terms of how long it takes to actually train someone, it really differs and depends on their technical skills. But most people have the basics under their belt within an hour. Um, there is an enormous amount of functionality in the software, so you will kind of need to learn as you go. Um, but what I would recommend is that if you are doing a repetitive task or the task is taking you a really, really long time, just pick up the phone and ask us if there's a better way to do it, because most of the time the answer will usually be yes. Yeah, great. Thanks, Kira. So Sam, you do lots of training. You got any further tips for us? Yeah, absolutely. So I would recommend recording the training sessions and then that way you can come back to them later if you need a refresher on a particular point that was covered. And there's always a lot covered and it's really hard to remember it all in one go. So if you have the ability to record it, it's going to help you so much. Um, I would also recommend just giving us a call if you need training on a specific task. It's pretty simple and quick to run you through how to do just that one particular task over the phone. And then it's going to sink in a lot faster when you immediately go and do that task. We can also send you instructions via email afterwards, just so you have it handy when you need it. And just so you know, if you work with us at Elms, sometimes we're going to have a cheeky look at the searches you're running to make sure that you're using the right fields and operators. And if not, if something looks a bit off, then we're going to give you a call to lend you a hand. That's a really good thing to know for our lawyers out there, I think, Sam. <laughs> so the next question is when or if you should bring this software in-house or just use an external provider. So most of the top tier law firms have the services in-house as, as of course they have an ongoing supply of work, but, but this group can be really expensive to bring on board. So you've got to pay for your e-discovery experts, but then in addition to that, you pay, have to pay for all of the IT products and the infrastructure that goes into supporting those experts. It's not all doom and gloom though. You can charge uh, a portion of it back to your client for the services you provide. So you can recoup some of that money. But if you're going to use an external provider, then that means your law firm or, or your corporate company only use the service when you need it and you can pass that whole cost on to your client. So you don't need to pay for the service if there's a low supply of claims that require this, this technology and services. So I suppose I'd only bring this in-house if you had the work to support it and you had an experienced e-discovery consultant to run that service line for you. And Kate, do many corporate clients bring this in-house? Yeah, yeah, great question. So there are quite a few that have it in-house now. They're usually the major banks, the regulators, some of the mining companies have it. Again, it really depends on whether you have a constant flow of litigation um, and you need to consider whether this would be claimable on your project insurance and whether you could claim costs back, costs back in the event that you win your claim. So you need to take lots of things into consideration. So now I suppose we should actually talk about what this, this type of um, service and software costs. So um, all of the e-discovery providers in the market charge a combination of either fixed fees, hourly rates and per gigabyte rates for the storage um, and the software and the storage of the data. Yeah, e-discovery providers should be able to get pretty close or pretty accurate with their cost estimate, depending, on depending of course of whether you've been able to provide them with enough detail. 
So one thing that usually goes awry is, for example, you might say that you've got 100 gigabytes of data to be reviewed and disclosed, and we will provide you with a cost estimate for that 100 gigabytes of data. And after the course of ask, we will ask you many, many questions to make sure we can get, get an understanding of how much data you've got and what the requirements of the matter are. But if the plan changes between the cost estimate process and when we actually kick off and you give us a terabyte of data, and then of course you agree document categories with keyword searches, then you're gonna need a lot more consulting time and the cost will increase sometimes dramatically. So you just need to keep that in mind. So Kate, do you wanna tell me how long you're actually tied to the cost? So for example, if a lawyer estimates the matter is gonna go for a year and then it settles after only three months, do they still need to pay for the whole year? Yeah, yeah, absolutely not, Sam. You should only pay for what you use. So if you estimate the matter's going to go for a year and it settles after three months, then you should stop paying the fees after three months. So that's certainly something you can turn off quickly if you need to. So now let's talk about how um, Sam would expect these tools to evolve over the over the next, what, five to 10 years. Sam, could you run us through that, please? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the future of these products is going to be based on artificial intelligence and building specific AI models for particular types of matters. So continuous active learning or technology assisted review is something that we see pretty much on every matter now. And that's been adopted fairly quickly based on how long it's been available. So I think in the future, these types of functionalities are going to become even easier to use and more intuitive. For example, Reveal Brainspace has more options on how you choose to run continuous active learning. So this means it's now much more feasible to use it to locate documents which are likely relevant to your legal case issues and not just relevant in general. It can also search across photographs and it transcribes video and audio content, which hasn't really been seen very much before. So the AI models are getting more and more advanced every day. And some of the internal processes we currently undertake like junk culling will now be able to do be done much faster using AI, which is great for the client as it's going to reduce the consulting time. So I think these types of functionalities is going to be a lot of what we see in the future. And it's pretty exciting. Yeah, sounds pretty exciting to me. Um, <laughs> but I'm a bit of a geek, so who knows? So Kira, can you run us through your top six benefits of a litigation database, please? Yeah, of course. So firstly, the data and documents are stored in Australia with Amazon Web Services, and it has bank grade security. Next would definitely be the deduplication and searching, and of course, keeping organized in the database. Uh, my last two would have to be the continuous active learning or technology assistive review, as Sam just mentioned, and also the, the streamlined review as well. Yeah, so with deduplication, Kira, can, can that, is that always 100% accurate or can it go wrong? So sometimes it can go wrong. So we would always recommend engaging your e-discovery provider prior um, right at the start um, where you collect all of the data from the onset so that we can help you identify any of those issues with how the data is stored and how to go about collecting it so that you can get the best result from that deduplication process. Yeah, great. And and you talked about streamlining the review. What, what sort of things can, can you do to help with that? So a couple of things. So sorting chronologically, uh, batching documents for review so you don't have any double ups in review and also the coding panels and keyboard shortcuts as well. Great, because they're all customizable, I'm presuming? Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, fantastic. So that's litigation databases in a nutshell. So Sam, um, can you tell us, um, we're going to talk now about chronology support. Could you run us through what products are available in Australia today? Yeah, sure. So there are really only three tools that we're aware of right now that lawyers are using for chronology building, which are Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel and Evercron. So Evercron really adds quite a bit of benefit to the chronology building process. And we're going to be demonstrating that as part of the Techie Tuesday series for the CLI in June this year. But if anyone's interested in seeing it beforehand, just reach out and we can organize a session. Sounds fantastic. Looking forward to that one. And Kira, can you tell us what does Evercon actually do? Yeah, of course. So Evercon is specifically designed to support the building of chronologies and generating advanced witness bundles in real time, instantly forming connections between the witnesses, the documents and the issues. We've only been using this software for about six months and have now seen so many use cases beyond chronology building. 
So for example, we have one client who is regularly a project director on construction projects and whose company regularly gets sued at the end of each project. So once they feel like the project is going south, they start to build a chronology to track how people are interacting with each other, the tones of conversations and any documents which track, which track the issues so that when they do receive notification of a claim, they can defend it quite aggressively. And we also have one law firm who use it to keep the case documents, key case documents organized for each matter and for each client. And we also have one corporate client who uses the software to keep their external law firms organized. So in addition to building chronologies, the software also allows you to store key case management documents in the one place. So no more trawling back through emails and document management systems to find your pleadings, advices, submissions, expert reports, et cetera. They simply upload them to Evercron and share the matter with any internal or external party, which makes you all on the same page all at the same time. And in addition, the client can also then see the chronology being built in real time. So it allows them to provide access to their internal resources to assist with the chronology when the need arises. Great, thanks, Kira. So, so when should you use this particular software? So we think you should use Evercron for every chronology that you build. Uh, having prepared many, many chronologies over the years myself, the benefits of being able to share a chronology with whoever you like as it's being built in real time means that everybody is looking at the same real time version all of the time. It's never out of date. So it can save you hours and hours of time updating the Word version only to, find, only to find that you're updating the wrong version of that document, which has happened to me on more than one occasion. So in addition, you can export fully hyperlinked indexes and documents from Evercon, which is really simple and enables you to produce subsets of documents to send to different external parties really quickly and easily, which I think is a real benefit of this product. And in addition to that, the developers have really thought about how you should interact with the chronology and its underlying documents. So it enables you to search not only across the chronology, but across the underlying documents as well. And you can annotate them, comment on them, highlight them, or rate them according to favorability to your case. It also combines multiple manual tasks, which lawyers do on every matter. So it combines all of those tasks into one bundle. So for example, you can build a chronology, you can build a witness bundle for each witness, you can prepare a Dramatis persona for each witness, you can build an issue bundle, and then you can also see how the issues overlap with the witnesses and the documents. And the list goes on and on. The functionality is really good. Uh, it's a really good piece of tech, and I would really encourage people to reach out and, and ask us about it and, and have a play with the tool and see if you like it. So, Sam, can you just talk to everybody about um, how hard it is to train someone in this tool and how long does it take? Yeah, so not long at all, actually. So this tool is really intuitive to use. So you can literally learn it within an hour and be fairly self-sufficient. Sam, does the tool have a good inbuilt help program? Yeah, so the support within Evercron is amazing. So you can just ask a question within the tool in the little chat box, and then it's generally answered within a couple of minutes. If it's something really technical or a bug or something, then that might take a bit of time to fix. But generally speaking, if you just have a question on like you need help with how to do something, someone's going to respond to that with the answer within minutes. Yeah, fantastic. So Kira, can you use this in-house yourself or do you need an external consultant to help you with it? So the beauty of this software is that once you're trained, you can pretty much run with it by yourself so you can bring it in-house. We do recommend that you still use the power of a litigation database to process your documents and then import them into Evercron so that you get the benefit of these three things, deduplication, making everything text searchable, and also extracting the metadata from the documents. So this will assist you to automate the coding of the documents, so the date, the title, uh, people involved, all of those kinds of fields. And this can save you an enormous amount of time rather than sitting there manually coding the documents in Evercron. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, no typing is what we say. So what does this type of software cost and, and how long are you tied to it? So there's a couple of options here. You can buy an enterprise license, which would include a number of user licenses and an amount of data, and you'd need to sign up for that for a 12 month period. Or you can buy a per matter license, which will give you one user license and 10 gigabytes of data. And I suppose if you go with this option, then you can pass that cost on to your client. So it, it's really quite cost effective from that point of view. So Sam, how do you reckon Evercron's going to evolve over time? 
Yeah, so I would expect to see in the very near future a witness statement analysis component and the ability to import a document like a witness statement or brief and then have the software automate the hyperlinking of that document to its underlying documents. Um, cool. So th the searching is very simple in Evercron, but I would also expect Evercron to further refine the ease of searching in the system so that it eliminates the need to construct a search at all. And I would also expect the software to evolve into a more visual display of the linkages between people, documents, and issues. Fantastic. I really look forward to the witness statement tool. Um, it's going to be a bit of a game changer, I reckon. Yeah. So Kira, top nine benefits, hit us. So the first would have to be the security. So the data is stored in Australia in the Amazon Web Services in Sydney. So we have the bank grade security. And number two would be that the tool is very intuitive and easy to use. Number three, uh, it's always looking at an up-to-date version of the chronology. Number four, you have the ability to interact with the chronology and all of the documents in it by searching, highlighting, and commenting. Number five, you can provide external people access to Evercron and they can instantly see the chronology and any updates that you make. Number six, you can automatically build witness profiles and bundles as you work through your chronology. Number seven, in Evercron, there are heaps of ways to sort and filter data without getting out of order and without needing to construct an elaborate search. Coming in at number eight would be the excellent in-tool support. And lastly, but not least, in Evercron, you can link the facts to the people, to the documents and to the issues really quickly and easily. Thank you, Kira, that's excellent. Love your nine top tips. Mm -hmm. So now we're gonna do a couple of little demos. So Sam is gonna take you through a hyperlink spreadsheet and a fully text searchable solution. So um, the documents that we're gonna use in this demo have been sourced from the Queensland Supreme Court website. Um, then Kira's gonna go, go and show you her six favorite functions in the litigation database. And the documents Kira's gonna use for her demonstration come from the Enron data set. So we don't have time for a full demo of these products today, but if you would like one, please just reach out and we'll tailor something that is specific to you. So over to you, Sam, for your beautiful hyperlink spreadsheet. Yeah, of course. Okay, so this is a really um, simple hyperlink spreadsheet. So this is a PDF version and I'll show you the actual Excel version in a moment. But this we can prepare within a matter of minutes and it's just a simple list of the documents, typically as you would uh, for discovery or disclosure um, and as per a document management protocol as well. So you'll have your document ID column, you've got the date of the document, the type, the title, etc. And then it's just got a hyperlink for each of these documents that takes you to that document. So this is completely automated. And even though we've only got a couple of documents here, if you had thousands of them, then we can still do it in just the same amount of time. And then you can easily have all of your documents hyperlinked like this. And if I just click on any of them, you'll see. So it just brings up that document straight away as well. So it's a really easy way to share this offline. If you have other parties that you want to share your uh, list of documents with, then you can just send this to them with the documents and then they get access to this hyperlinking as well. So the other benefit about having this in PDF format is the ability to search across it. So if I just press control F here to open a search, uh, this is a pretty basic search and pretty much all software is going to have this. So I'll just do a little demo first. If I just type in e-trial, it's going to highlight every time that e-trial shows up. However, the benefit of using PDF for this hyperlink um, spreadsheet or having this in PDF format is the ability to search across not just what's in this document, but across your whole document set as well. So I'll show you how to do that. I click on this little cog wheel here and then go open full Acrobat search. Then this window is gonna pop up. So you can see it's gonna say in the index here. And that means we're searching across not just the 
list of documents, but across all of the documents in the set. So if I run the same search again, it's now going to tell me how many documents in my set that eTrial word comes up in. And if I click on any of them, then you can see here every single instance of it with a little excerpt of where that shows up. And further to that, if I click on any of them, then what it's going to do is it's going to open up that document and it's going to zoom right into where that shows up as well. So you can quickly navigate to that whenever you need to. So you could, if you had a small matter, Sam, you could use this as your little, your little searching database, really. Absolutely. So yeah, if you didn't want to have a full litigation database with all the bells and whistles and you just had a few documents, you could kind of use this to replace that, use Great. it to search across them. And Sam, what if the lawyer doesn't want to have to look through 12 documents? What if they want to then do another sub search on that? Absolutely. So there's a little button down here called refine search results. And so now you can see it says search within the previous results for, and we can type something here. So how about I type in checklist? And so now within our previous search of eTrial, now it's searching for checklist as well. So you can kind of refine that down to however you need it. Yeah. And if you wanted to take a record of all the searches you were running as well with the results, there's also got this little save button. So you could take a report on the results of that search and refer to it later. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay, so that is the PDF version. I'll just show you the Excel and, version. And Sam, you yep. only need the free version of Reader to be able to use this solution. You don't need Absolutely. any fancy software. You just need the free version. Yeah, that's right. Fantastic. Okay, so this is just an Excel version of the same document. And it doesn't have that same functionality of searching across all of the sub documents as well. But the benefit of having an Excel is the ability to sort and filter. So if I wanted to sort by title, I could do that. If I wanted to maybe filter and just show only the documents in 2018, then I can do that as well. So that's the power of the Excel version rather than the PDF version. Yeah, so Sam, if you wanted to add a relevance column, you could actually use this to review your documents and, and, and put a relevance column in that said, yes, this document's relevant, then filter by that, that particular column and you'd have your list of disclosure, really. Absolutely, you could definitely do that. Fantastic, and you could use it for witness statements, issue bundling, any sort, any sort of thing that you want to filter by would be very useful. Yeah. Great. Okay, there's just one more thing I wanted to show you before I pass it on to Kira, and that's just a different way to think about this hyperlinked bundle. So I showed you a hyperlinked list of documents before, but this one here is a witness statement. So if you um, click on any of these documents, then it's going to take you to the, the same one, each trial document here. And so it's just a different way of thinking. You don't always have to have your documents in a hyperlinked spreadsheet. You can hyperlink a witness statement or anything else you need. Yeah, and, great. And, yeah. and Sam, you could also use that too if you wanted to search across a whole stack of witness statements. So your our witness statements and the other side's witness statements, you could combine them all and search across them all in one go as well. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, great. Okay, well, that's it for me. So I'm going to show you a couple of my favorite things in the database. So the first one would be the ability to keep really nice and organized. So over on the left-hand side under the issues tab, you can see that there's a folder structure that you can build to help you keep really nice and organized in your database. So for example, at Elms, we always record the different collections of documents that we receive. And we can also tag all of the different documents you refer to in your witness statements, your expert reports, and the different disclosures as well. So it's just keeping everything really organized and keeping track of the different documents you refer to and in what bundle. The next thing I'm going to show you is the keyword searching. So I'm going to use the find bar at the top left hand corner and I'm going to type in a keyword. So let's search for the word original. So when I click find, it's going to do two things. The first thing it will do is it will tick all of the documents in my list that contain that particular word. And it will also highlight in yellow that keyword in the body of the document. So you'll notice that I'm currently on the formatted or unformatted content view, and that's going to show you that keyword highlighting. 
rather than having to scroll through to find where all of the documents have been ticked, you can move to what's called your working list. And that's going to pull up just those documents that contain the word original, so that 2,400. Um, you will also notice that there's some other highlighting throughout the body of this document. So that is what we call a search term family. So I'm just going to expand this on the left-hand side as I talk through it. So a search term family is essentially a group of terms that you can assign a color to. So in this particular example, all of the red highlighting is words that we've added to the privileged terms search term family. And anything in green is related to the search keyword search terms. Um, and as you can see, the yellow is then the keyword searches that you're doing from your find bar. So the really great thing about this section is rather than having to scroll through and try and find each word highlighted, you can actually use the toggles at the top here. Uh, now, in addition to this feature, you can click on the keyword highlight search book and you can select or deselect any uh, highlighting that you do or don't want to see. So for example, if I wanted to remove the green and red highlighting and I just want to look for the word original in the body of the document, now when I use these toggles, it's just going to jump to the instance of that particular word. You'll also notice that on the right hand side, I have a coding panel called search term families. And this actually gives you a breakdown of what particular words from each search term family exist in that particular document. So in this particular document, the word assignment will be highlighted in green and the privilege term will be council. So that's the that other privilege terms are pretty handy for the junior lawyers to look through when they see the red, just to give them a flag, Kira? Absolutely. So it really just helps the reviewer alert to the fact that that docu document may be subject to privilege. And um, in addition to that, it, the search term families can be a really good quality assurance check tool. So I'm now going to take you to the analysis tab and into the search terms section. So in this section, I've set my positive terms to anything that is privileged. And in my negatives, I've set it to anything that isn't privileged. So when I click apply, it's going to show me all of the words that have added into my privileged search term family. But what it's also going to do is on the right hand side here, it's going to tell me how many documents have been coded with a negative term, so anything not coded privilege, that uh, has this keyword hit. So that's a really good quality assurance check that you can do because you want to double check that those documents are definitely not subject to privilege. So the next thing I'm going to show you is I'm I'm going to head back to the document screen and show you the pop out screen. So if you have two uh, monitors or more, you might want to use this feature just so you have a little bit more real estate on your screen. So to do that, I'm going to click the options drop down and open as linked workspace. A workspace just refers to the layout of the panes on your screen. And I recommend using the view view screen. So when I click on that, it's going to open a second pop up window. And the benefit of using this is I have the benefit of having on the left hand side, the document with the formatted or unformatted content view. So I get the benefit of that keyword highlighting, but then also on the right hand side, I can look at the PDF version of that document. So this is the exact same document. It's just displaying the information a little bit differently. And then you just push that to your second screen, Kira. That's exactly right. So click and drag that over and then you can collapse um, the view pane over here if you want to as well. Uh, the next thing I'm going to show you is customizing the coding panel. So over on the right hand side here, you can see that we have created a number of different custom coding panels. So if I click on legal relevance and issues, you'll see that we've built a coding panel that helps you stay compliant with your document management protocol. Um, now, we can add or remove any number of fields that you want in this section, and we can also build it for a particular purpose. So, for example, if you were creating witness bundles or preparing witness statements, you might want to use the witness affidavit section, and this is where you can tag different uh, documents to those particular witnesses. So that's fully customised. We can have anything you want in there at all, Kira. Yes, pretty much. So we definitely recommend having a chat to your e-discovery provider so that they can build a coding panel panel that's suitable to the task that you're doing. Perfect. 
And the last thing I want to talk to you about is the continuous act of learning. Now, I can't exactly show you this um, on the screen, but I will just talk to it for a moment. So continuous active learning is where the process where we give a legal team a sample set of documents. They then review that sample and code it for relevance, so either relevant or not relevant. The computer then scores those documents on a scale of between negative one and one. Negative one being highly unlikely to be relevant and one being highly likely to be relevant. So the idea is that we order the documents as per their score so that the legal team are reviewing the high scoring documents first and therefore the more likely to be relevant documents first. So it's a really good review strategy. Yeah, that 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 is enormously helpful to speed up your review, Kira, because mm -hmm. you know normally we would just review chronologically, but yeah, if you can certainly spill the most relevant documents to the top, that's very helpful. That's exactly right. And the computer is consistently learning from your coding as you go along. So it, it's constantly rescoring the documents as well. And, and what happens if there's a rogue coder, Kira? What, what happens? Can you tell that? You can tell that. So there's a number of different quality assurance checks you can do. So you can do review conflicts, which is where you might look for documents that are scoring really high on uh, the computer thinks they're highly relevant but a coder has coded it as not relevant and vice versa. So there's a number of different ways that you can quality check that. Yeah. And Kira, can you just show them how to generate a report so no one has to type anything anymore? Absolutely. So it's really easy to produce a report. So you just select the documents that you want to spit out a report for. So I've selected these ones. You click on the tools drop down at the top here and click on report. This pop-up screen will open. Now, we have already set up a template that contains all of the usual fields you would see in a list of documents, but you can go ahead and edit those if you want. And you can also choose your different uh, output format. So we usually use Excel. So when I click submit, that is going to download the report for me. And what that looks like is if I open this up here, you already automatically have a nice report in a matter of seconds. Well, that certainly saves typing. Can you also show them just one more for me, Kira, the timeline feature, which is pretty helpful? Yeah, absolutely. So if I just switch over to the timeline view here, at the top here, you can see that it basically is a visual representation of the different document dates in your database. So because I have some documents selected, it's highlighted that in a darker shade of gray. Um, but for all of the documents in my current list, uh, you can see it plotted along this, um, this timeline at the top here. So Kira, this would be pretty handy to identify if you're missing a group of documents. Absolutely. So if you know that your particular date range should have a certain number of documents, say between 2006 and 2008, and you have a gap there, that can immediately alert you to the fact that you might um, have a gap in your document collection. Perfect. So thank you so much, Kira. So thank you so much for running us through that today, Kira. Um, now, the, we've only got a few more things to talk about before we finish up today. Um, so there are lots of other helpful tools out there for lawyers. So certainly if you've got to conduct an e-trial, there's lots of options in the e-trial front. So if you're in Queensland, the Supreme Court has a free um, SharePoint tool that it uses for e-trials, which is really helpful and it's good that it's free. Um, but if you have a more complex trial that's going to run for weeks and weeks, then you might want to organise your own real-time transcript and e-court software so that you can really get more efficient when you're in the e-trial process because it'll save you about a third of your time in trial. So um, that's certainly worth looking into. And if you need any help, reach out to us. Um, we use um, document source mapping tools. So when we go out and identify documents that need to be collected from your client, and then we go about collecting them, we uh, visually present that to you in a, in a document source map. And we use a product called Miro for that, which is very helpful. And then of course there is e-briefing. So there's lots of tools out there to support the e-briefing process. Uh, there's a little product called e-brief, which is really good and quite cost effective for lawyers to use. Um, we use Evercron for e-briefing, or we also use a fully hyperlinked PDF solution, depending on which barrister we're going to. So lots of tools out there for e-briefing, and we would encourage you to reach out to us and ask for help if you need it. Um, but thank you all very much for coming along today. Um, we have had a blast so far with this series, 
and we've got one more coming up. The next and final session that we're going to run you through are the types of services and support you should expect from your e-discovery e e provider. And we're going to explain the value of e-discovery so that you can sell this to your clients. So thank you all very much for coming along today. Um, I hope you enjoyed our session and we look forward to seeing you on the 1st of June. Absolutely. And thank you very much, Kate, Kira and Sam. Really, really appreciated that. It's just fascinating the, um, the number of tools that are available and what you can do with them. It's just incredible. And I'm sure that just keeps changing all the time and getting better and better. So just fantastic to be able to see those in practice and for you to walk us through those. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming along today. Really appreciate it. You'll find all of these folks on pretty much every social media platform. So if you do want to reach out. And I know that uh, Kate's provided the contact slide, so use that, grab them on social media. Um, I'm sure that uh, they will be more, in fact, they know they will be more than happy uh, to chat with you. So thanks again, everyone, and looking forward to seeing you back for episode five. Thanks, Terry. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thanks, Terry. Bye.